Uh, so my name is Andy Neal, and this session is called um, Digital Content uh, Reuse. Just before we get started, just a couple of um, housekeeping matters. Um, the, the session here will run 10 minutes late, because we're starting 10 minutes late, so we'll run till about quarter past 12. Um, but after lunch, the sessions will start again on time, um, as per the schedule. Um, we'll get into questions um, and comments pretty quickly. Um, just to remind you and ask you to wait for a microphone um, before talking, and it's, it's so that um, other, you know, the people where this is being streamed to can, can hear this. And lastly, just a reminder that we do have the collaborative docs um, working here at, at NetHui, and it is really valuable if you, um, if you can contribute to that. So I'm just going to kick off with a, a couple of minutes of context. Um, uh, my day job is as the manager of um, Digital New Zealand, based at the National Library and Department of Internal Affairs. And so one of the things that I do um, with my team is we, we get to spend um, time working with organisations, um, helping them to get material online in a way that people can reuse. And in the library world, I guess traditionally, um, we know of digital content as things like you know, documents and images and video and, and music. Um, I mean, it's the stuff that we kind of see every day on the internet. And I just want to show you um, one quick um, New Zealand example of, of, of reuse, of, of remix. Um, so um, up on the screen here, we've got um, uh, an artwork created by Alan Shaw. Um, it actually came out of the, the Mix and Mash competition. Um, and he combined licensed cartoon, uh, cartoon images from um, Dylan Horrocks um, with poetry from uh, Rene Liang, as well as with his own illustrations. Um, and, I, and he basically created this wholly new uh, artwork. And I just, I can't show it all, but it, it just, it's a vertical scroll. And it goes on and on. And it's beautiful. And um, it's something wholly new and valuable that was built on top of the work of others. And I think that's, that's really at the essence of what we, what we mean when we talk about digital content reuse. I have to say, though, at the moment, I do find it quite difficult to um, exactly define what digital content is. Uh, Perhaps more, more accurate, accurately, it, um, I think of it as just digital material. So, for example, um, think of it as, or think about a, a spreadsheet of data. You know, a spreadsheet is a file, it's an object, but it's got data in it. You know, the session before this was talking about data. Is, is a spreadsheet data, or is it something else as well? Um, or um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript source files. So these are digital things. Um, or 3D models, we perhaps wouldn't typically ordinarily think, think of them as content, but actually I, I am starting to, and I'm not really making any differentiation between these, these digital represent, representations of things in, in whatever form they are. And so some of the, the conversation I think that'll be interesting today is um, perhaps, perhaps think about a broader context for digital content, and it's not, perhaps not just about an image or a document. Um, but think about the digital representations that we're starting, to, we're starting to see. I guess the question is, well, why is this important? Why is um, digital um, reuse important? I think it's important because when people look for content, um, they're, not always looking for, they're not always looking for it to, to watch something or to acquire um, new information. They're often doing it because they want to do something with the material. Um, and, and that really brings it into the space of creation uh, and production. And I want to show here just a very short um, video clip. Um, we could sit and watch this stuff all day, but um, it's, um, it's from the short series called Everything is a Remix by um, Kirby Ferguson. And you, if you haven't seen um, the Every, Everything is a Remix series I, and you're interested in this stuff, I strongly recommend you go and have a look at it. It's quite, quite incredible. So just a couple of minutes here. The act of creation is surrounded by a fog of myths. Myths that creativity comes via inspiration, that original creations break the mold, <coughs> that they're the products of geniuses, and appear as quickly as electricity can heat a filament. But creativity isn't magic. 
It happens by applying ordinary tools of thought to existing materials. And the soil from which we grow our creations is something we scorn and misunderstand, even though it gives us so much. And that's copying. Put simply, copying is how we learn. We can't introduce anything new until we're fluent in the language of our domain. And we do that through emulation. For instance, all artists spend their formative years producing derivative work. Bob Dylan's first album contained 11 cover songs. Richard Pryor began his stand-up career doing a not very good imitation of Bill Cosby. And Hunter S. Thompson retyped The Great Gatsby just to get the feel of writing a great novel. Nobody starts out original. We need copying to build a foundation of knowledge and understanding. And after that, things can get interesting. After we've grounded ourselves in the fundamentals through copying, it's then possible to create something new through transformation, taking an idea and creating variations. This is time-consuming tinkering, but it can eventually produce a breakthrough. James Watt created a major improvement to the steam engine because he was assigned to repair a Thomas Newcomen steam engine. He then spent 12 years developing his version. Christopher Latham Scholes modeled his typewriter keyboard on a piano. This design slowly evolved over five years into the QWERTY layout we still use today. And Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb. His first patent was improvement in electric lamps, but he did produce the first commercially viable one after trying 6,000 different materials for the filament. These are all major advances, but they're not original ideas so much as tipping points in a continuous line of invention by many different people. But the most dramatic results can happen when ideas are combined. By connecting ideas together, creative leaps can be made, producing some of history's biggest breakthroughs. Johann Gutenberg's printing press was invented around 1440, but almost all its components had been around for centuries. Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company didn't invent the assembly line, interchangeable parts, or even the automobile itself, but they combined all these elements in 1908 to produce the first mass market car, the Model T. And the internet slowly grew over several decades as networks and protocols merged. It finally hit critical mass in 1991 when Tim Berners-Lee added the World Wide Web. These are the basic elements of creativity. Copy, transform, and combine. And the perfect illustration of all these... I'm sorry, we have to end that there. I would really recommend you go and check out this, this series, um, Everything is a Remix, though. So... I like to think of digital, I mean the relevance of this is that I like to think of digital content simply as a, a carrier mechanism for ideas. And I'd suggest that digital content in, in all of its manifestations um, is able to inspire us to quite incredible levels of new creativity and enterprise. And I'd probably go further and say that I think that in the era that we are in that um, digital content is actually a, quite a significant driver of, of innovation. And here's why, because in the current era, um, we have the ability to, to see or experience something online um, in, digital, um, in digital form, and then we can access that content, whether it's images, video, digital representations of the real world, um, and, and, and get those representations and build on them, iterate on them, create something new. And I don't think this connection between digital content and innovation is actually fully appreciated yet. So I think the, um, we'll open up the, the conversation. Um, I think the, one of, the, the, conversa one of the, the, the questions I'd really like to dig into is um, how can we encourage digital content reuse in New Zealand? Um, and I'd be really interested in, in hearing about kind of some of the issues uh, and, and some of the opportunities. There are also just a couple of other questions. Um, let me see if I can find this that I have in mind. Thank you. And I'll, I'll sort out the bottom of the screen in a minute. Um, so the kind of things that I think are quite interesting 
to talk about are what is the current culture of digital um, reuse in New Zealand? So, you know, we have our legal frameworks and copyright, but we also have a body of practice and uh, a culture of doing things that is in contradiction um, to that legal framework. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in what we think our young people are doing because I think that can help us uh, understand what the future looks like in this space. Um, Secondly, how can we encourage commercial use of, of digital content? I think a lot of the examples we have seen are, uh, of reuse of digital content, uh, perhaps people would claim are for personal use um, because of some of the legal issues. But how can we help make that jump from personal use and you know, what we might see as just kind of creative enterprise to actual commercial use and, and seeing more value from, um, from digital content reuse? Uh, and the, the third area um, is just a relatively new phenomenon that, again, hasn't really quite hit us yet, is what are the issues and opportunities that the arrival of 3D printers um, are perhaps going to have on digital content reuse? If you, if you think of um, digital representations, 3D models, as a type of digital content, what is it going to mean for digital reuse when somebody can um, print out at home uh, the latest Lego set? Um, from designs that they've got on the internet. This is already starting to happen. Um, and I think it's something that, in terms of uh, content reuse, um, is something that's going to be quite challenging for us. So um, let's open this up and um, just take some comments and questions about um, uh, digital reuse in New Zealand. Hi. I just uh, wanted to ask if anyone noticed the major flaw in the little video we've just seen. Has anyone noticed what's wrong with it or what 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 lacked? Sorry? <laughs> oh the video. No woman featured in it. There wasn't an author, a female author, but women are actually inventors as well. And um, that's sort of a gender bias I realized there. Uh, good day. Um, so just kind of touching on the first thing, the current culture of digital reuse. Um, I make content uh, for YouTube and just got like my website and stuff going on as well. And I do like music videos and um, just comedy videos and stuff. And it's actually really cool what happens. So um, I've had a few examples of if I'll put out like a, a video or something, someone will take that video and do whatever they want to it. Like, um, I had a few people do like uh, their own versions of my songs, and they just you know do it, upload it to YouTube, whatever. And I had a few people just like cut up videos and stuff. And I had this one dude um, from Christchurch. I, I just put up a track on SoundCloud, and he just um, took it and then made a dubstep remix of it and sent it back to me. And he was like, "Hey, check out what I did." And I was like, "Wow, that's uh, that's awesome." Um, and yeah, and it, and it's going everywhere. So it's in New Zealand, and and like if you look on. Um, if you look on YouTube and, and things like that, the, the amount of things that are being reused is insane. So, like, you know, you've got, um, specifically with music, you've got cover songs of, you know, you, you search, like, whatever a popular song is now, and there'll literally be hundreds and hundreds of, of people, you know, ha having their own sort of versions of it. And same goes with, um, you know, trailers, videos, and all that sort of stuff, people just cutting it up and, and doing their own thing. Um, which is cool, but that kind of also opens up a whole thing with, uh, you know, copyright and if they're allowed to do it, which most of the time they're not. But, um, yeah, that's kind of what I got. Yeah, for sure. So I can just wait for the, for the microphone. <laughs> do you put a Creative Commons attribute, no commercial use, or any sort of... Yeah, yeah. YouTube gives you the opportunity to do that. Um, obviously only on, on your own p personally created content. So on all my original stuff I do, but I also do a lot of covers of other people's songs, which obviously I can't have the opportunity to do that because it's not my stuff to... But, but do you make a point of um, giving attribution where it's due? You mean for cover songs and stuff? Right, exactly. When you're remix remixing somebody else's content. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I mean, when I do, it's generally for 
popular artist anyway, so it's in the title. Like it'll be like me doing a cover of Katy Perry or whatever. Um, yeah. So when you do see somebody else remixing your own material, and uh, if you if there is no attribution to the original source, do you make a point of educating about the the use of Creative Commons and um, yeah, use? Right. yeah, kind of. Um, so most of the time, I mean, I'm in an interesting position anyway because I'm trying to get my stuff out there. So if someone takes anything of mine, for me, it's it's good anyway because you know more people will see it, and I'm cool with that. But I can understand that if if someone was in a different position, was maybe making more money than I am or whatever, then that would open up a whole another issue. Um, but yeah, no, if someone does does take my stuff, I, I don't normally have an issue with it at all. Um, yeah. With that. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, actually, it's really cool. I do stuff on SoundCloud as well, and um, do basically three types of things. Um, I do my own stuff, which I all Creative Commons, and I have to. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Um, there's a, an album of an artist that I love, which they released as Creative Commons, and it was an instrumental album, so I'm actually remixing that as a vocal version of that album. And I have to say, um, someone in Canada, like a little band, heard that and decided they liked it, and they've started doing it live and, did a U and posted a YouTube video of them playing that song live, and I cried when I saw it. It was awesome. Um, but the third one is I actually find amazing instrumentals, uh, uh, all industrial stuff generally, and, um, and again, do vocal remixes, collaborating with people all around the world. It is the coolest thing in the world to be able to have that. So I guess the point for me coming out of that is that um, it, it's about community building again and about um, creating, I mean, the thing about SoundCloud is you get to put your stuff up and even if only like two people click on it, you know, this week or whatever, you still get that, that feedback loop that makes you want to keep creating stuff because creative people will create stuff regardless. And so I'm um, creating the, the, like, basically facilitating community development and recognition. Um, it all helps with that. So some sort of you know, awards and, and um, festivals and those kinds of things all help with getting people to create stuff, in my opinion. Okay. I don't know what, what you think about that, but yeah. And I'd like to know what your SoundCloud is. <laughs> Does anyone have any insight into what they think uh, the, you know, young people across New Zealand are doing? You know, how much is, of this is, is happening um, or not? Um, this is more a comment about uh, um, some insight that I'd like to have. I have a 10-year-old stepdaughter and I would like to facilitate her participation in digital culture, but she's not a gamer. She's not particularly interested in science. She likes content. She likes watching YouTube movies and her friends do that too. And when she creates stuff, it quite often is with a digital camera making movies and what she likes to do is get a, um, a song and make a music video t for that with her friends and so you know I think this is a, um, a, a you know and, and YouTube is full of remixes so she's got the cultural uh, modeling to do this and I think it's a, a, it's, it's a great thing to encourage uh, the, um, but she can't do it without breaching copyright, without, without breaching license terms. You know, there's this myth that if you put your song on YouTube with no copyright infringement intended, then it won't get taken down. Um, so, you know, so my challenge is how can I encourage her in this activity at the same time as introducing her to the notion that there is a transaction with the uh, people who created the content that she's remixing. And I guess that's part of the issue that we kind of, one of the things that came through in the video is that copying is, it's proposed that copying is how we learn, so presumably this is kind of something to encourage. Um, but then on the other hand, it's kind of, our legal frameworks tell us it's something that we shouldn't do. Could I, could I actually just answer that one? So I've been in the business of educating people about copyright and intellectual property for, probably about 20 years. And I guess what we've really seen over the last 10 years in particular is that copyright has moved from being something that's really only of interest to a relatively small number of people and the standard, you know, the big publishing industry, book publishing, newspapers, etc. 
copyright and an understanding of copyright is essentially just part of the um, standard set of skills um, of digital literacy in this era. So the reality is from the time you're sort of like 10 or whatever, you know, you can start actually legally have have some kind of um, social media presence. I think this is this is really just the issue that you're actually having to sort of get people understanding some absolute fundamentals here. What we can actually see is all the major social media platforms um, have got a huge amount of content that is actually Creative Commons licensed. So really getting people to look out for the stuff that you can actually use. Okay, there are some issues about, hey, we want to be able to use these really famous hit songs because they're part of our culture, etc. We want to be able to do spoofs, parodies, etc. Some of that stuff is 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 actually going to be, you know, like fair use. It's going to be permitted. But if you want to get people understanding, okay, where you can be entirely creative is to use, reuse stuff, remove mix it where you've already got the rights up front, the permission up front to be able to do that without any fear of infringement whatsoever. And if you can get the kids playing in this commons, you know, so this is the play pool of stuff where you don't have to worry about infringing on someone else's rights. If you look at YouTube, videos can be uploaded on YouTube under Creative Commons licences. Um, and they're already a lot. They actually embed the licensing. It, co it flows through with it if you actually um, reuse something. You can put up your video under Creative Commons license. If you look at Flickr, you know, billions of photos on Flickr, about 10% of them are under Creative Commons licenses, which gives you only a couple of hundred million photos that you can actually choose from. You know, so there's plenty of material out there. This is increasingly the case. People from Flickr, um, are, you know, the co-founder of Flickr is actually on the on the board of Creative Commons internationally. Um, YouTube, you can actually see they get this, they understand this. So this idea of the licensing, building in the permissions is really, is now part of a lot of the social media platforms. So that's what I'd be saying, hey, can we actually show you some basics? There are a lot of great little videos about Creative Commons. Um, Creative Commons New Zealand has got some really good ones. So that's the way that I'd say. She won't, she's not interested. She wants to remix Justin Bieber and Katy Perry. It will, it will just destroy her interest in, in being creative and, and embracing technology. All right, thanks, Dan. So if we just go to the... It, it, could, make her more, it could make her more creative, but um, um, it, th th this is something we really have got to grapple with. You either actually play by the rules of the copyright owners and and you, you seek out permissions or you kind of operate in this space where you don't really know whether your stuff is going to be taken down or not. All right. Here we go. Chris Turner, Computers and Homes. Um, I personally think that if uh, somebody went and wanted to copy my YouTube video, I don't know about the two people who have spoken about it, I think that would be the ultimate compliment, really. Now, my... Um, my question is about, uh, you know, Facebook has a hell of a lot of shares, and I'm wondering about uh, somebody's lolcat photo that they've put up on the internet, and someone, well, sometimes hundreds of people go and recaption that and post it again. Is that a breach of somebody's copyright? Uh, and I don't know about you, but I share an awful lot of stuff. Is that something that I should not be doing because it's not my, not my content? Or is that, yet again, a compliment to whoever put it up in the first place? So, so just before we go to Jane, has anyone got a quick response to that question? Just right next to you, yep. Um, uh, I'm not a professional or anything, I'm just a dude that does stuff. But my understanding was that on Facebook, that as, as soon as you upload a photo or whatever, it becomes Facebook's property and they can like essentially do what they want was my understanding like it's not like a yours to um, take I don't know if anyone knows better or whatever sorry does that then mean that if you post a YouTube video up on Facebook that it then becomes Facebook's and it's free for anyone no Um, just my understanding, and again, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm, I'm sure there are plenty in this room, but that is that you, if you own the rights to that photograph, you can put it up and there are no problems. If you choose to release it under a Creative Commons licence, 
then as long as people abide by the licence you've chosen, they can do whatever your licence says. So like for my, for example, my blog is Creative Commons Attribution Required. So people can take anything out they like out of my blog and they can republish it anywhere they like as long as they give me the credit back. And that's the choice that I've made. Other people have made different choices and you have to respect that everyone has their reasons for the choice they make. But the important thing is you know with your photos, if you took the photo, you decide how you want it to be used and you make that decision and ultimately you have to live with the choice you make. Right. So I'm going to end this, sorry, I want to end this, this stream of conversation. Um, Jane, you had a, a comment. Um, just really quickly, sorry, I wanted to pick up on the point that Dan made about his is it stepdaughter who was creating videos um, and she often can't create anything without infringing on copyright, but at the same time, she doesn't really give a damn about copyright. It's very complicated. And, you know, what I, what I see firsthand all the time is that copyright and reuse rights are really complicated for adults and more so for children. And children, you know, often don't understand it or it's not really relevant to them on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I'm increasingly wondering is... At, at the very least, could we start embedding the age-old notion of attribution very strongly into digital citizenship streams in schools? So we're teaching children the ethics of attributing other people's work that's not theirs, regardless of whether they're infringing technically. But if we can get children to think about their behaviour online in terms of, you know, plagiarism and and all those things they're going to have to use in their workplaces later on anyway. I think maybe that's a way to start. Just a really quick follow-up on what Jane was just saying. is um, it was, It's quite amazing to see the raw mix and mash entries come through from the schools. Um, there's a lot of stuff that comes through which is not valid for the competition because of attribution. And so people went to all this effort, these school kids went to all this effort to make something and to remix something, but without actually understanding that they can't use material that's outside the, that, that um, falls under copyright. So it's, it's a really, yeah, I just really echo Jane's point. Oh, um, I, I think that, that, um, that copyright confuses people, and I think it confuses young people in particular, and I think it's an obstacle discussing copyright, and I think that they do need to know about attribution, and they should definitely know about giving credit where credit's due and linking to people at a, as a social level rather than at a legal level. I think as soon as people start discussing copyright, it turns people off, and especially young people. They think, oh, no, law means cops, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I think that's one of the obstacles to, to young people, um, young people's reuse. Um, I'd, I'd just like to, 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 to um, talk a little bit about what Scoop does. So we're, we're, a, um, we're, a, we're a sort of like a raw content provider to the internet, if you like. We feel out, we see our role as sort of um, feeding Google with raw content, which is it's essentially intended for reuse. Um, and it is reused by people turning it into news articles. And more recently we've started, well actually not more recently, we've, for quite some time we've uploaded raw audio and raw video of news press conferences. And um, it's spectacularly easy for us to do that. It's not easy for us to edit it. So in terms of encouraging commercial reuse or even young people's reuse of content, um, our video is all Creative Commons, and it all can be reused, and it can be reused by students in schools to produce real news stories for for um, for uploading and at, at proper lengths. I mean, we upload a 45-minute press conference with John Key, which covers a million different issues. Um, that could very, very easily be turned into quite useful news content, which we would then reuse commercially if if um, if it was available for us to do so. So I think there's interesting opportunities. Um, can I ask, there's a question at the back, but just before we move on, can I just, so what's your business model around, um, so you, you create the material, the, the raw material, someone else does something with it, what's your, what's your take of, of that? Well, we, um, I, th I mean, I was discussing this yesterday in the copyright session, we, we see a lot of potential for us to, I mean, this is one of the other problems about commercial reuse of digital content and, and about Creative Commons. Um, we're a commercial website. Theoretically, I'm not allowed to lift stuff from blogs. I'm not supposed to do that. I do it all the time because 
A, we're not particularly commercial because we're in the online content news industry, which is not particularly commercial, period. Um, but, um, I mean, our, our business model ultimately has to be about um, the copyright of the collection of our content as opposed to the copyright of the individual components of it, which gets a bit complicated from legal terms. But we need, there needs to be some sort of transactional agreement between the people that produce the content for us or edit content for us or curate content for us to allow us to commercially exploit it in order for us to pay for the facilities and to pay for the infrastructure which provides the platform in the first place. And there's an element of a new social contract in, in that which I think needs to be developed and thought about. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm going to step it back a little bit to address a question somebody asked, and it's also one of the, the questions up there, to try and give a, shed a little bit of light, and it's a very unrepresentative sample, on young people and their current culture of digital reuse. I do a, a little bit of teaching in the tertiary sector, and one of the courses I teach on, we do a little bit of discussion of remix culture from a theoretical perspective, not from a practical getting them to actually do remix. But at the, th these are second and third year uni students. And at the start of the section on that, I asked the class of roughly, I think it was about 150 students, um, how many of them had, had engaged from a creator perspective with remix culture and I'd say ballpark 5% of the room. So th these are perhaps not yet the young people who are as immersed in remix culture and reuse, digital reuse culture, but they're certainly you know, students that have been around it for a while. When we get into more discussion about what remix culture can actually entail, everything from writing fan fiction to you know, all the various types of remix culture, it actually turns out about 20% of them have been engaging in it. And one of my points is that I think that elements, types of digital reuse have almost become invisible. They've become so embedded into just creating content that people don't actually think about the fact that they're engaging in digital reuse. And I'm not sure that's necessarily a problem, but I just sort of wanted to flag up that there might be elements of digital reuse which people don't even see as being that type of engagement. Thanks, that's a great insight. Down the front here. Um, I guess I guess I'd like to bring up a, a point around something. It's not to do with the fact that this content is digital at all. Um, we're talking about how children deal with content, and of course, it's a it's a natural evolutionary feature of humanity that we we naturally copy. You know, we copy our parents. You look at a five-year-old copying is built into them, and I, and I don't see how. Um, Obviously, there's how, how do you work against nature? We also try and embed in our children some, a set of values. We have, you know, we, we teach values in our schools. You know, compassion, sharing. How can we teach sharing, yet still be teaching something which is diametrically opposite? I think the problem, in many senses, is our own confusion over what it is that we really believe in. Do we believe in? Um, uh, so something as hard as, you know, all, all content must be owned and, and is belonging to the individual? Or, or is it that we believe that we should be sharing and we have to, some, have to come to some kind of accommodation um, with the commercial entities who are creating the content? Um, I, I don't think... The current system obviously isn't working. I mean, you, you can't seriously ha expect children who are trying to remix things, you know, like, Gone now. The, you, know, the, you can't under, expect children to really understand the legal implications of copyright. They should be free to be able to do things that they are doing. Commercial copyright really was centred around um, book publishers originally who were, who were producing books in commercial quantities. Trying to apply this law to teenagers creating you know, remix videos, I just think is it, it's, it's cracking a walnut with a sledgehammer. It's, it's, it's really not addressing the core, the core values that we need to support in society. And if I could just comment an example of, I think one of the transitions we're seeing is like, you know, in previous eras, kids would cut up magazines, um, you know, and that's, you know, copyright material, and they would make collages, and, you know, you put them on the wall, and you would share them. 
but we're in a different era now where the creative tools are quite different. So you can still do that in the digital era, but the way of sharing that is perhaps putting that on YouTube or what have you, and that's perhaps one of the, one of the areas where we've got, you know, the behaviors are perhaps still the same, it's just that the tools are different, maybe, um, at the back. Hi, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the second point, um, to encourage commercial reuse of digital content. Um, one specific example I thought of, because of my background, I was a programmer um, in the past, is that um, if we reuse a lot of the code um, uh, legally um, of other people create, then we actually don't need to recreate, reinvent the wheel. And that certainly speeds up things a lot, makes things easier. And also, um, yeah, software is still a big industry. If we want to grow the New Zealand digital economy, um, that's something a lot of people actually don't realize uh, the code is actually out there for you to use. There's a lot of frameworks, um, <clears throat> like pretty much every website out there needs authentication. There's um, uh, cookies, there's all these things then. Uh, it's common to everything, and you can just grab some code, quickly do it in two minutes, uh, rather than having to reinvent the wheel and do it in two months. And someone else might have taken your idea and, and uh, use it for their own purpose, um, which is also part of the competition. Um, uh, they, they could take your idea um, or they couldn't have come up with it themselves. But the, the key thing is the speed. You want to do things quickly. Um, the other thing I thought um, I want to uh, hear from people about the, um, yeah, the issues and opportunities of the uh, 3D printers. Um, I, can, I, like, I may be ignorant, but um, for me, uh, I can see it would be cool to have, say, a scale model of a uh, BMW or Mercedes sitting at home, and I can easily print that. But what other things can I do with a 3D printer? And also, uh, what issues? There may be an issue with me copying Mercedes and have it sitting on my desk. I don't know anything about that. Okay, cool. So perhaps while people are thinking about that, I mean, I think the, the 3D printing side, we're still in the really early days of, of what's possible. Just while you're thinking about that, I just want to ask the gentleman at the, the front about just the commercial use, um, posting things on YouTube. Do you, do you mind ask, do you make any money from this? Uh, yeah. So yes. how, do you make, how do you make money? So it only works on 100% original content. Um, and basically once you've put it up there, you monetize your video and it's done through Google, a YouTube partnership program. And then basically you just put little ads on your video um, and then you just get a share of ad revenue, basically. But you can only do it on your 100% original content. So if it's a cover video, then you can't, yeah. Okay, great. So we've got someone at the back and then the front and the... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, can I ask now? Uh, the question was about 3D printers. And I read a very interesting article earlier this week that someone is now using 3D printers to make customised shoes for athletes. So basically, um, they're 100%, you know, sort of fitted for you when they come off the printer. Um, there's lots and lots of things with 3D printers that we're not even thinking about of making original content with them. Um, my wife is a custom baker. She bakes cakes and the like to water. She decorates cakes. Um, many, many is a time that she and I have sat back and thought, we just can't wait for the ability to make sculptures out of toffee, out of, out of a digital printer, which could then be used as a framework for her making more elaborate and, and nicer designs um, at a lower price. And then, of course, you've got the straight copies of other people's things, sure. It's going to be the same as with digital music, only now it's going to be in the physical realm rather than something behind the screen. There's going to be people who feel they've got massive investments in some design. Um, you know, I can imagine Apple will get really upset if people start making themselves rectangular cases for their um, um, Androids. But um, you know, we're going to have to deal with this over time. Very upset. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, at the back. Yeah. On the internet, there's uh, in the culture, there's a lot of memes. Well, you've probably heard of memes. They're ideas that are spread through pictures or s sayings. And for most of you, I think you might know all your base belong to me. 
Stop me if I'm wrong. But, um... <laughs> Thank you. And with that, there are a lot of just faces, so no one can really pinpoint where the faces came from, but everyone uses them to refer to in your... Uh, who was talking about the videos? Yes. Um, well, with the instead of videos, there are pictures, and if you copy a picture, it's called a repost. And you're not allowed to do that, because that is very wrong. And you do not get points on your YouTube partnership for... Was it you? So not the man with the beard? No. no. <laughs> oh, good. So where's the second microphone at the moment? OK. Can I just ask, sorry, can I just ask the people who are wanting to, so who's, who's wanting to, to talk? One over here. All right, so let's go here and then the lady. Just, is it on? Is that on? Sorry, where is the other microphone? The, the man who, I think he laughed, talking about his 10-year-old. I think one of the issues that we're grappling with is how the technology has changed around copyright. And it seems to me that, it, well, what's the difference between that girl recording herself doing a Katy Perry video and posting it to anyone who might have done the same thing with a violin on a street corner in Wellington busking 20 years ago? OK, it's copying, but they're not taking anything. The principles behind copyright were around protecting the original copyright holder. In both of those cases, the original copyright holder is not losing anything. Nobody's going to watch a 10-year-old on YouTube instead of watching Katy Perry. So I think, you know, again, is, we didn't prosecute those other people, so is it an issue now? The other thing is, I think, very much just to reinforce the attribution. And we have a really easy mechanism for getting kids to put CC licenses on their own work in schools every all the time and getting that culture of attribution. And as they put licenses on their own work, they begin to understand the value of that and all of the different ramifications of a, of a Creative Commons copyright. And they can therefore start to understand and become part of a culture of attribution and understanding other people's rights and licensing and, and the nuance of all of this. All right, thank you. Um, just in regards to the uh, 3D printers stuff, I dabble in tabletop gaming a little, and basically every tabletop gaming company is really, really scared of 3D printing becoming big, because when it does become big, people can scan their models, and instead of you know having to shell out 40 bucks yeah. for you know one model, you can print it off for 20 cents, and they're not going to make any money anymore. But I don't know if that's going to be a huge problem because I mean it's it's the same with trading card games. I mean you can you can buy the actual cards or you can just print them off on your printer. And when you print them off on your printer, everyone can tell and they always look crap. And <laughs> and 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 everyone looks down on you because you're uh, on you because you're the guy using fake cards. Yeah. And you try to trade them and then and and then someone you know hits you because you gave them a fake Charizard. <laughs> I guess we can look forward to a mashup of Monopoly and Risk, maybe. Yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, over here. I think um, we should look at how um, technology has progressed. The gentleman over there talked about his wife doing cake decorating. Now, in the last maybe eight years or so, you could actually print onto an inkjet light printer edible um, decoration that you can place on a, on a cake. And now with, um, and so what I'm saying is that as things go along, you can actually, there is actually a 3D printer that will allow you to print chocolate or print molds for chocolate and things like that. So if you are interested in 3D printing in New Zealand, there's actually a group who are actually doing quite a lot of it on a, on a hobbies basis. Um, and if you look up Rip Rap New Zealand, um, that's one of them. And for example, you're talking about mishmash culture. I think in the early days, people cut things out of magazine, but they also create their own magazines. And that started the zine culture. And now we have people who write content for their own zines. And, you know, and we have um, 
places like Alphabet City in Auckland who encourage zines and stuff like that in, in Auckland. Cool. So kind of here. Talk to me if you need to get addresses and stuff. So we've got five minutes left. I, I just there'll be a few a few other comments, but I, just to start wrapping this up, I would be interested in you know based on the, the things that we've talked about, observations about you know what can we do, what should we do, what might we do to encourage um, digital reuse in New Zealand. Over here. Just it's not quite on that, but just really quickly for the the tabletop games companies, how is it different from like music companies ten years ago when people realised they could print their own CD? So maybe it's they have to transition from selling something physical to selling data. And I'd also like to see a mashup between printed tabletop gaming pieces and chopped up printers. <laughs> um. Cool. Sorry, just um, back to cake decorating. Um, <laughs> Clay Shirky did a wonderful um, piece, I think it was for Ted or, or somebody, and um, he began his talk talking about this cake company that um, would take your child's um, drawing and print it onto a cake for you. And um, this company had to stop because, of course, the children were drawing their own representations of Disney characters mm. and things like that. And I think, getting back to what this person over here was talking about, memes, I know at what point does... Um, you know, culture transcend copyright, you know, and I think that that comes through with when you're talking about memes um, and children doing their own representations of Disney characters. You know, at what point is it so derivative that it, you know, a, 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 draw, a child's drawing of, of Mickey Mouse, you know, through all of these iterations? Um, yeah, and I think that, yeah, these are issues that we need to address Thank and think you. about. Um, I just want to throw in two points. First of all, I, I actually think that 3D printing is going to hail a whole new era. And I actually think we shouldn't soften it. Yes, it's going to displace a whole bunch of industries, but that's okay. Um, because like printing, chocolate, like printing chocolate today is going to translate to printing food, proper food sources tomorrow, particularly when we see 3D printing starting to combine with nanotech. Um, so I mean, we're, yes, we're going to displace a whole, like, you know, copyright, how copyright currently works, and we're going to displace a, a bunch of industries, but we're also going to possibly be able to displace poverty and hunger. <laughs> when everyone can access the food that they need, either from their own 3D printer or from going down to the library to use the 3D printer. Um, and uh, we've already got cases of people, <clears throat> a guy in the States actually built all the components for a house on a 3D printer and then assembled the house and he has a house now. So I mean, the, the actual possibilities are huge and I think we're going to, it's going to, we're going to go through more pain before it gets fixed, but um, our current perspective on copyright is, go, is already and has been for some time holding us back, and with 3D printing, we're going to see an, an, a massive land grab and war, <laughs> um, intellectual, I guess, war, not necessarily otherwise, but, um, but it's, an, it's an important thing to go through, because I think we're going to go into a whole new thing. The other thing I was going to say is fair use. If we, I don't know what the deal is in, in New Zealand, but in Australia we don't have fair use laws. Um, so if we had really good fair use laws, a lot of these issues become um, uh, moot because uh, the kid doing a drawing or a mashup of Katy Berry or, or me doing a mashup of Katy Berry, I'd prefer Nine Inch Nails, but okay, um, is going to, it, it doesn't matter because it's a fair use of that work. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I think we've got an opportunity um, next year in the, you know, in, the, in the copyright review to be looking at that kind of thing mm -hmm. at the back. Kia ora folks, my name's Ivor Jones from Hitangata Digital Media. Copyright is dead. Copyright is dead. We share everything every day on Facebook. There are guys who can pr print kidneys using 3Ds. Right? Copyright is dead. It's up for us to innovate and optimise and create quality and value, and that's how you'll get paid. If you produce crap, you'll get crap. If you produce quality, you'll get paid. Um, I had a bet with a colleague uh, about whether someone would say verbatim copyright is dead in the session, so thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, and the people who, who know a lot about Creative Commons will, will understand this, um, copyright is something that is unlikely to go away. Um, it underpins everything. Uh, yes, by all means, we need to look at things like fair use, which, by the way, is incredibly complicated uh, and um, isn't a very clear set of laws that you can apply uh, to know what you're allowed to do uh, when you're making your YouTube video. Uh, the problem here, or, or really what we need to be doing is both instilling an understanding of ownership and copyright and attribution and these things that underpin everything, because they are fundamental, but at the same time encourage sharing. 
the, as you'll know, people like Katy Perry and her record um, company aren't all that concerned uh, about the occasional remix by some kid. The problem is when people start, uh, their competitors start selling CDs with, with their music on it. That's what's most uh, worrying to them. So what we need to be doing is, is really instilling these, uh, these values in the digital literacy training and things like that the children are getting. And so we get to the point where, yes, it is meaningless on the YouTube video to say no copyright infringement intended or I do not own any rights in here, but at least it's an, ex an acknowledgement by the people doing it that there is such a thing as copyright. So that when they do grow up and jo join the workforce and they're in charge of producing a user manual for whatever product their company makes, they don't just go to the competitor and copy it. Because it, it's all very well to talk about these things in terms of music videos and, and things like that, but uh, copyright extends to everything. And although copyright uh, copying is fundamental, there comes a point where it's just not appropriate. So it is a very difficult thing, but we need to be encouraging this remix culture because it, it is something that's growing and it is fundamental to a certain extent. But at the same time, instilling these values in there so that people understand what they're doing. Thank you. So we're pretty much at time. Does anyone have one final last comment to make? Or we'll wrap this up. Great. It's been a very interesting session, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to run the rest of the, the remix video, um, which goes for about another eight minutes if anyone's interested. But um, thank you very much. we're using right now. So let's travel back to the dawn of the personal computer revolution and look at the company that started it all. Xerox. Xerox invented the modern personal computer in the early 70s. The Alto was a mouse-driven system with a graphical user interface. Bear in mind that a popular personal computer of this era was operated with switches, and if you flipped them in the right order, you got to see blinking lights. The Alto was way ahead of its time. Eventually, Apple got a load of the Alto and later released not one, but two computers with graphical interfaces, the Lisa and its more successful follow-up, the Macintosh. The Alto was never a commercial product, but Xerox did release a system based on it in 1981, the Star 8010. Two years before the Lisa, three years before the Mac. It was the star on the Alto that served as the foundation for the Macintosh. The Xerox star used a desktop metaphor with icons for documents and folders. It had a pointer, scroll bars, and pop-up menus. These were huge innovations and the Mac copied every one of them. But it was the first combination it incorporated that set the Mac on a path towards long-term success. Apple aimed to merge the computer with the household appliance. The Mac was to be a simple device, like a TV or a stereo. This was unlike the Star, which was intended for professional use and vastly different from the cumbersome command-based systems that dominated the era. The Mac was for the home, and this produced a cascade of transformations. Firstly, Apple removed one of the buttons on the mouse to make its novel pointing device less confusing. Then they added the double click for opening files. The Star used a separate key to open files. The Mac also let you drag icons around and move and resize windows. The Star didn't have drag and drop. You moved and copied files by selecting an icon, pressing a key, then clicking a location. And you resized windows with a menu. The Star and the Alto both featured pop-up menus, but because the location of these would move around the screen, the user had to continually reorient. The Mac introduced the menu bar, which stayed in the same place no matter what you were doing. And the Mac added the trash can to make deleting files more intuitive and less nerve-wracking. And lastly, through compromise and clever engineering, Apple managed to pare the Mac's price down to $2,500. Still pretty expensive, but much cheaper than the $10,000 Lisa or the $17,000 Star. But what started it all was the graphical interface merged with the idea of the computer as household appliance. The Mac is a demonstration of the explosive potential of combinations. The Star and the Alto, on the other hand, are the products of years of elite research and development. They're a testament to the slow power of transformation. But of course, they too contain the work of others. 
The Alto and the Star are evolutionary branches that lead back to the NLS system, which introduced Windows and the mouse, to Sketchpad, the first interactive drawing application, and even back to the Memex, a concept resembling the modern PC decades before it was possible. The interdependence of our creativity has been obscured by powerful cultural ideas, but technology is now exposing this connectedness. We're struggling legally, ethically, and artistically to deal with these implications, and that's our final episode, part four.